wanted to introduce our speaker. Uh, Sarah, can you, can you hear me okay? I've got a clicker in this hand, I've got a microphone here, a microphone here, so I'm kind of wired tonight, so I'm ready to go. My wife and I have uh, <coughs> lived in Centennial at Orchard and University for about 45 years, and we have fond memories of jumping in our car, driving south on University, coming to County Line Road, seeing a gravel road, a fence, cows, antelope, south of County Line Road. Uh, my grandparents homesteaded near Castle Rock, and so for 76 years I have been driven, or have driven, uh, Parker Road. So I have seen some changes, a lot of changes. and. Uh, I guess I, I don't mind progress, it's change I don't like. <laughs> so we're going to get started tonight. Um, first of all, I want to do a little 
little history of the transportation corridor that is Cherry Creek. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Trappers Trail, the Cherokee Trail, Smoky Hill Trail, the Denver and New Orleans Railroad, and Colorado Highway 83, uh, east of here known as Parker Road. And this is a map from 1845, and you can see I've kind of highlighted Cherry Creek. It's not that long, it's only about 40 miles long, but had a significant impact on transportation along the front range of the Rocky Mountains. And as you can see, up north is the South Platte River, to the south is the Arkansas River, and then you have little streams running north from what we call the Palmer Divide, and south uh, to the Arkansas. And so I'd like to start with the Trapper's Trail, which ran up what today is basically Interstate 25. This was used in the 1830s by mountain men and traders it connected sites on the Santa Fe Trail with Fort Laramie on the Oregon-California Trail. It connected several forts north of Denver, all civilian trading posts. And you can see a close-up of uh, the uh, Palmer Divide, also known as the uh, Arkansas Platte Divide. For you motorists, it's best known as Monument Hill. And it basically shows that there were two basic trails across the Palmer Divide. One following Plum Creek, which is west of Santa Fe through Sedalia, and Cherry Creek, which is east of I-25 to your east. And in the 1830s, with all these trading posts that traded with the Native Americans, the Mexicans, the whites, there was need for a wagon road. And this Trapper's Trail wagon road used by these traders was the very first wheeled vehicles using this very first road up and down what today is the front range of the Rocky Mountains. And then in 1849, we had something called the California Gold Rush. And there were Cherokee Indians from Oklahoma. Of course, we've heard of the Trail of Tears, the forced removal of the Cherokee from Georgia and North Carolina to Oklahoma because of gold that was found on the Cherokee land. Well, they were displaced to Oklahoma, but since they were knowledgeable with uh, gold mining procedures, they did travel to California in 1849 and 1850. And there were Cherokee among the many uh, California-bound uh, gold seekers that did actually use parts of this Trapper's Trail that ran from Benso Fort on the Arkansas River up through Pueblo, across the divide, down Cherry Creek, the present-day Denver, and then for north to Fort Laramie. And you can see on this little thing here, because uh, why did they go this far north uh, before turning west? The answer is, of course, to the west of us is the Rocky Mountains. No place to take a wagon, I guarantee you. To the east is what Stephen Long in 1820 called the Great American Desert. So it's up this front range of the mountains, from Pueblo up Fountain Creek or Jimmy Camp Creek, across the divide, and then down Cherry Creek to the South Platte River. And then, of course, in 1859, we had the Colorado Gold Rush. And this is a little diorama carved by Hank Gantz of Inglewood, and this shows the excitement uh, on May 6th, 1859, with the first large paying quantity of gold. And this was found up by uh, present-day Central City. And so in 1859, we had something called the Pikes Peak Gold Rush. Pikes Peak or bust. And of course, they would take your wagons. If you had your farm wagon on your farm, that's what you would bring. Uh, there were other people that would load their materials on wheelbarrows, or just walk. And this was a real rush. 
And Albert Richardson said, thus far, no gold has been discovered within 60 miles of Pikes Peak. But the first reports located the diggings near that mountain in Pikes Peak, one of those happy alliterations which stick like burrs in the public memory, was now the general name for the whole region. And so for, specifically for the Colorado Gold Rush, we had a new trail called the Smoky Hill Trail, which was blazed from various towns on the Missouri River, like Kansas City, uh, Westport, Atchison, Leavenworth, to Denver. And it crossed the High Plains. It did not follow the South Platte River, did not follow the Arkansas River. It actually cut across the High Plains of Colorado through present-day Cheyenne Wells and Lyman. Promoters back east said, take the Smoky Tra Hill Trail. It is the quickest, shortest route to the gold fields. And it was, but it was not the safest. It did not have the wood, the water, the grass that was needed for large immigrations of gold seekers. And so this very first branch of the Smoky Hill Trail, from, uh, the branch from Lyman to Denver, was also known as the Starvation Branch. There was actually documented accounts of cannibalism on this early 1859 trail. And if we look at the Smoky Hill Trail uh, from Lyman to Denver, there were actually three distinct branches. The first branch used by the Leavenworth and Pikes Peak Express Stage Road uh, in 1859. In 1865, we had the South Branch uh, called the Butterfields over in the Dispatch. And a year later, Ben Holliday, the Stagecoach King, he blazed the North Branch of the Smoky Hill Trail. And it was Horace Greeley that said, go west, young man, go west and grow up with the country. And this was in 1859. And if you did come west back then, it was, you were a pioneer. And that all changed for Denver in 1870 with the arrival of the railroad. That changed everything. Now it was much easier to bring civilization to the wild country in the West. And as you can see from this across the continent uh, painting, you can see way up in the corner, way up here, here are the last stagecoaches the last covered wagons leaving, and what has arrived with the railroad is civilization. Schools, churches, houses. And it was the Denver and New Orleans Railroad in 1881 that ran from Denver to Colorado Springs. And that is the railroad that basically put uh, all travel on the early trails uh, to finish the long distance travel on trails because now we had a railroad going from Denver through Parker, Elizabeth, Elbert, on down to Colorado Springs. And this is a little picture of one of the locomotives and trains of the Denver, New Orleans as it crosses Cherry Creek, which would be located near the inter near uh, Lincoln, Lincoln Avenue and Highway 83. And then we have a map from the early 1910s, 1920s. You can see most of the major highways followed what today is, Interstate 25 through Castle Rock. But over on the right-hand side, you can see Highway 83. There was a road on uh, the east side of Cherry Creek and on the west side of Cherry Creek. A little later, you can see here's Highway 83 coming through Parker to Franktown. Then at Franktown, you did not continue south the way we do now. You had to jog east a ways, and that was because, have you recognized, or do you recognize this bridge here? This is the bridge across Cherry Creek just before you get to the entrance to Castlewood State Park. And this is a very ornate single-span bridge. It was completed in 1949. 
The problem is it was a bridge to nowhere, also known as a cow pasture bridge. The Department of, of uh, Highways had enough money to build the bridge, but then they ran out of money. So at the far end of the bridge was a cow pasture. And this is significant, this bridge. Uh, I know you don't like traffic on Parker Road, but the original alignment recommended and proposed for Interstate 25 was Parker Road. They were going to build a second bridge like this one, and that would have been Interstate 25. Okay, that's an introduction to more or less the travel history, the travel along the Cherry Creek Corridor. Now we'll talk about the mile houses along Cherry Creek. And mile houses were a series of houses used as stage stops, taverns, and rest stops for the general public along Cherry Creek. And this little map on the bottom shows 20 mile house in Parker. This is where the south branch of the Smoky Hill Trail came down present day Hilltop Road into Parker. And it was there at Parker that the Smoky Hill Trail South Branch merged with the Trappers Trail and Cherokee Trail coming from, coming north from the Pueblo area. And then a little farther north you see 17 Mile House. And that is right, right here, 17 Mile House, 20 Mile House. Now these are mileages from downtown Denver. That's how they got their names. How far were they from downtown Denver? And what I'm going to show is a few slides, um, a few photographs that was in a book called The Smoky Hill Trail by Margaret Long. She did a lot of research on the Smoky Hill Trail and this was back in the 1940s when she had much easier access to the properties more than we have today. And so we do start in Pueblo and just west of Main Street, just, just south of Main Street and just west of Parker Road is the 20 mile house. And you can see on the left side of the uh, picture here, you've got a little, little section of the house that uh, would become the Pine Grove Post Office. And that was a very uh, small part of 20 Mile House. But this picture taken in the 1990s shows the house, um, oops, wrong button, shows incorporated into this 1947 house, the, the, the garage was actually Pine Grove Post Office. And in the 1990s, this was the, well this was the Sulphur Gulch stage barn used by David Butterfield in the south branch of the Smoky Hill Trail. Uh, this was demolished, disassembled to make room for general progress. Uh, the Parker Area Historical Society uh, dismantled this barn piece by piece. They labeled every piece of wood with a nice little sticky note saying this is exactly, exactly where this piece goes back. Well, over time, the mice found those little sticky notes. They uh, destroyed that. So there is a barn in near Parker that has a pile of historic junk wood. <laughs> but back to 20 Mile House, you can see this house which was uh, demolished in about 1993 and you can see the left of the garage section was the old Pine Grove Post Office. This is what it looked like when they demolished the house and this is what it looks like today. It's the uh, small section of the 20 Mile House the old Pine Grove Post Office, and it's uh, not really open to the public, but it's been protected. It sits in a little tiny 
tiny parcel of ground now, now surrounded by parking lots and banks and so forth. But there are two nice little markers here. That the one talks about the Smoky Hill Trail, uh, erected way back in 1986, and a newer marker on the Cherokee Trail. Now if we go three miles north, the 17 mile house, this is located just south, I'm sorry, just north of the Douglas Arapaho County line, uh, a couple miles south of Tagawa Gardens. But this has been saved for the most part. Margaret Long took, uh, found a photograph um, of 17 Mile House taken before the 1900s. And this house has been saved. And the South, uh, the uh, Cherry Creek Valley Historical Society, along with the town of Parker, Arapahoe uh, County, the city of Aurora and Centennial, and other uh, uh, waterway stewardships, they've all banded together to save 17 Mile House. It has been restored. A lot of furnishings of the 1930 era. And you can visit this today. There's good access to the Cherry Creek a bike path. But this house is open uh, certain days of the month for public tours. And the barn is still there. And 17 Mile House was not used by stagecoaches. It was used more by Teamsters and the general traveling uh, public. Now if we look at this little map again, you see up here is 12 Mile House and nine mile house. There's two little tiny separate branches of the middle branch of the Smoky Hill Trail. Uh, one little branch followed Piney Creek down to Cherry Creek. The other branch uh, followed what today is Smoky Hill Road down to Cherry Creek. And if we look first at 12 Mile House, it was built and operated by John Melvin, and Jane Melvin. Uh, it was a stage stop. Uh, Jane spent most of her time in the kitchen cooking. Uh, John Melvin was the postmaster and did all the business associated with uh, a very booming stagecoach and Teamster stop facility. And originally, the section on the right was the original 12 mile house uh, with expanded business. They built the two story. Uh, addition that you see on the left. Uh, when the railroad came through, there was really no need for a stage stop or a tavern. And so much of this building was moved to neighboring ranches and used for some of their outbuildings. This little section right, right here was saved. They took off the second floor, which had a dance hall. And this first floor building was moved to Watkins and served as their liquor store until about 10 years ago when uh, a new store opened. And I'm not really sure what happened to remnants of 12 Mile House. And there has been some archaeological digs done by the Cherry Creek Valley Historical Society and other groups to try to find the exact location of 12 Mile House. Uh, I'm not sure we have pinpointed the exact location, but we did erect a very nice little plaque describing life at 12 Mile House. And these are members of the Cherry Creek Valley Historical Society and the Piney Creek uh, Daughters of the American Revolution that put up this little, little wonderful little uh, plaque. Um, just a little bit of trivia. Uh, this is uh, something that not too many people know about is this plaque is within the dog training area, the off-leash dog training area of Cherry Creek State Park. At this dedication ceremony was this, the mayor of Centennial, and she brought her dog. 
And so after this little plaque ceremony was completed, uh, it's very important for you to all remember that her dog was probably the first to lift a leg on how far was this, uh, the, 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 the little stanchion for that. And 12 Mile House talks about the importance of 12 Mile House as a stage stop, serving the general public. Actually, a little community evolved at the site, not at the site of Melvin, but across Cherry Creek to the west side of Cherry Creek to uh, what today is basically the intersection of Jordan Road, if it still went through Cherry Creek State Park and Bellevue. This was the railroad uh, community of Melvin. And this is the little school built in 1922. They just had their 100th anniversary of the construction of this nice little two-room school uh, with the uh, uh, start of construction of Cherry Creek State Park and the dam. They were required to move this school. And in 19, this, they, they moved it about 1948, just before the start of construction of Cherry Creek Dam. And in 1976, it was moved to the grounds of Smoky Hill High School. This is a very nice little uh, two-room school still used by various groups, such as the Cherry Creek Valley Historical Society. Um, but then, like I say, it arrived here in 1976, and it was moved out of Cherry Creek State Park in 1948. So in the interim, the Melvin Schoolhouse served as the Emerald Isle Tavern. And this was located at Quincy and Smoky and uh, Parker Road. Parker Road. Uh, I don't think there's anybody here. Maybe there is somebody that has been to the Emerald Isle. I know I drove past. Yes, I drove past it many times. But uh, this was seven. This was 12 miles. Melvin School. And then we come to Nine Mile House. This also is located within the boundaries of Cherry Creek State Park. And you can't really see much there. You can still visit the site of Nine Mile House. Uh, you go to the swim beach, you swim out about 200 yards, and you dive about 20 feet, and you'll be at the approximate location of Nine Mile House. And then we come Seven Mile House. We don't really know exactly where this site was. It was pretty close to Iliff uh, Avenue in Wabash, South Wabash, very close to the Cherry Creek uh, Golf Course. But we do have a couple photographs from the Cherry Creek Valley Historical Society showing people in front of Seven Mile House. And then finally we come to Four Mile House. This is still a very active uh, living history uh, location at 715 South Forest Street in Denver. Uh, this is from Margaret Long's Smoky Hill Trail book. Uh, the building over on the right side over here, this was the original section built in 1859, possibly one of the oldest remaining structures uh, in Denver. And it used, was used as a tavern, and this big new addition was added much later. But this was four miles from downtown Denver. Uh, you can visit it. It's, it's got uh, farm animals. It, it really does uh, interpret the history of the trails and stage stops. And then we continue down Cherry Creek. This is the little marker at Colfax and Broadway, back when Kit Carson still was on top. That's a different story. Um, there was a plaque 
added in 1938 that designated Colfax and Broadway as the end of the Smoky Hill Trail. And so basically Cherry Creek follows today's Spear Boulevard down to the confluence with the South Platte River here at Confluence Park. And with that, that completes the story of the mile houses and the transportation corridor along Cherry Creek. So I assume we have uh, time for a question or two. Denver and New Orleans Railroad. It was originally planned to go from Denver to New Orleans. <laughs> it didn't quite make it. Later it was renamed Denver, Fort Worth, and something or another. It didn't make it to Fort Worth. Eventually it was uh, uh, purchased by the Colorado Southern Railroad and it existed through Parker and Elizabeth until 1935. That is when there was a major flood on Kiowa Creek, Plump Creek, Cherry Creek. It wiped out uh, much of the, many of the trestles and tracks of the Colorado and Southern, so they decided not to rebuild. And at that time it was the Colorado and Southern, also known as the CNS, also known as the Crooked and Slow. <laughs> so, yes. How far can you go in a day? In a day, well, in the early days, like when Horace Greeley came across, the stage stations were uh, very primitive, and they really didn't run the stagecoaches at night. So, in a day, the stagecoaches could go like. Uh, 30 or 40 miles, but then they would stop for the night. Eventually, they ran 24 hours a day with a lot of good stage stations, a change of horses and so forth. So you could go do the 600 miles from, from uh, Kansas City to Denver in uh, just a few days. They were approximately three miles apart. You had four mile house, 12 mile house and 20 mile house that did serve as stage stops. They were true stage stations. 7, 9, and 17 were uh, on the stage route, but they were used more by the uh, Teamsters and the, the people coming through with freight wagons and the general traveling public. But yeah, they were about every three miles. And uh, like I say, 20 mile house. 7, 20, 12, and 9 were located where they were because they were at junction points with the Smoky Hill Trail, various branches coming down and meeting Cherry Creek. And so that was what dictated the location of 20, uh, 12, and 9 mile houses. And the other two just sprung up in between those, more or less, to serve the public. Yes. Yes, there's uh, many places you can see the old railroad grade. Actually, one of the little hiking trails within Cherry Creek State Park is called something like a railroad trail or something that you can follow the, pardon? Railroad, railroad bed trail. But when you get uh, east of Parker and you take Hilltop Road, up toward Flintwood, you can see distinct remnants of the, of the uh, railroad on the left side of the road. And then, if you know where to look as you're going from Elizabeth to Elbert to Eastonville to Falcon, there are many places that the grade is still totally obvious. It's all private property, so it's nothing you can just park your car and go hike. It's all private property, but the grade is still there. So, I, 
remnants of the stagecoaches, so like ruts in the, in the ground? Remnants, there. yes, yes, if you know where to look. Not along Cherry Creek, really, because it's all been uh, cultivated, planned, washed out, whatever, um, too much commerce. But as you get on the Smoky Hill Trail, uh, there are remnants that you can see uh, near Elbert, between Elbert and Lyman. There are stretches of, of the trail that you can still see the ruts, what we call swales. They are pretty obvious because they're little depressions, because the soil has been compacted and so forth. The vegetation has changed, and so there are places. A couple pictures in my book over there of uh, <laughs> the soils. Uh, that shows the obvious trail because of the change of vegetation created by the passage of wagons. But uh, nothing close to the metropolitan area. What is what can we do? Yeah, what are we Education. Well, 17 Mile House is a good example of buildings left over from the stagecoach era that will be saved with a conservation easement. Uh, we saved that. A four Mile House, it's education. There's not a whole lot you can really like field trips along the trail because like I say it's all private property but there are various places like four mile house 17 mile house 20 mile house that there are interpretive signs for you to learn more about the history and so I think that just education is probably the most important thing is just let people know there is history here and if there are people like the Dollars of the American Revolution, the Piney Creek chapter has taken extreme interest in 12 Mile House, and the old Melvin School. So the word is getting out that there is a tremendous amount of history right here close to home. Yes. Yeah, it's Palmer Divide. If you, um, yeah, you know, the Cherry Creek starts at Confluence Park in downtown Denver, comes, follows through Franktown, uh, Castlewood Canyon State Park, and it basically follows present day Highway 83 up uh, to a little place called Cherry Valley. Uh, there is several diff little different branches of Cherry Creek, that East Cherry Creek, West Cherry Creek, but they all have their headwaters in what is known as the Black Forest, very near Highway 83. Earlier you showed pictures of the gold rush dioramas. Yes. Do you know if those ever used to be in Central City before it became the resort town? The full story is in my book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Hank Gintz from Inglewood. He, he was in an auto accident. He became a paraplegic. He had limited use of his hands, but he, for years and years, intricately carved these very nice dioramas. They're maybe three feet by four feet. He carved about 55 of them and they were all in a private museum, his private museum in Central City, in the old livery, what is now the old livery place. Yes, when he passed away, the, this, the uh, collection of dioramas was dispersed. Some in Elbert County at Kiowa Museum, some at the Visitor Center in Idaho Springs, most of them at South Park City in Fairplay and the Mining Museum in Leadville. Those few four locations um, have all of his dioramas. One question up front. Well, 
Well, I'm not a native, so I love that you discussed the four, nine, 17, 20 miles. Yes. Smoky Hill uh, trail ran from Kansas City to Denver. And very near the town of Salina, Kansas, there are some bluffs uh, south of Interstate 70 that on certain days kind of give off a smoky haze. And the Native Americans and the early travelers uh, along the Kansas River and Smoky Hill River actually named them Smoky Hills because of rock formations and hills. And that became the name of the major river that ran across central Kansas, which in turn was used by the Smoky Hill Trail. So it all goes back to uh, bluffs near Salina. And another question was, Cherry Creek was named by early travelers, uh, named for choke cherries. Wild choke cherries. We have cho we have Cherry Creek to your east, to the west. You have Plum Creek, all named for the wild plums, wild choke cherries that the early travelers, as early as 1842, mentioned choke cherries along this little creek, which we followed toward the divide. So choke cherries. One thing toward the back. Yeah, there's one. Another question over here. You showed the trail earlier with the whole of the set of the up and it goes through central Colorado. Why didn't they go south? It was, there were three, three main branches to the Colorado gold fields. The south branch, which followed the Arkansas River through Ben's Fort and followed the Trapper's Trail and down Cherry Creek. Now, most of the immigrants took the South Platte River Trail, which has been in use since uh, 1820 when Stephen Long came here. Uh, they chose the Smoky Hill Trail coming right across the High Plains because of the businesses in Leavenworth and Westport, the uh, businesses promoted this trail as the quickest, fastest way to the gold fields. So you'd take your steamboats up from Missouri, from St. Louis, Missouri, up the steamboats up the Missouri River, and these businesses in these particular towns tried to entice the gold seeker off the steamboat and say, hey, come to my store, I will outfit you. All you have to do is just see that, that river there, the Kansas River, that goes to Smoky Hill River. Just take that, that will take you all the way to Pikes Peak. Unfortunately, it didn't. But there were enough people that were in such a hurry to get to the gold fields, they were duped into taking this shortest, quickest route to the gold fields, but not the safest. Four Mile House has a very realistic stagecoach. There are various stagecoaches in other museums along the Smoky Hill Trail, like Fort Wallace, Kansas, and Salina. There are some very authentic stagecoaches. There's a lot of reproductions, which aren't that great, but the Four Mile House has uh, the one that's still operating on special events. Yes, we're going to be uh, trying to get up here, so if you don't get right to eat yet, uh, put your hand up, look at Paul, if you have a question, get your hand up with me, and I will uh, give you the question. I know it's going to be a little bit of a question. Nine Mile House, it was on early maps. It wasn't a major stage stop. Uh, 
people today park their car at Nine Mile Light Rail Station. They assume it's nine miles from their office downtown, but it, it's just truly nine miles. But I don't think there was any remnants of Nine Mile House when the Army Corps of Engineers came in in 1948 and did their planning for the dam and the reservoir. So that's probably the seven and nine are very sketchy as to their history. No. No, just, just very little information on those mile houses. More questions or get it seated? Raise your hand if you need a ticket. We got one more. Thank you very much. Thank you.